<laughs> okay, welcome back to the scorecard. It is Tim Jack, and we have a special guest, Ross Edgley, with us. And before we sit down to eat a massive rack of ribs, courtesy of, um, I guess, today's podcast spot, our first ever podcast sponsor, yeah, uh, yeah. Athlete. They don't know. <laughs> yeah, they don't know. <laughs> but they've given us such a good product. We've attributed yeah. and dedicated our podcast this evening and YouTube Q&A to athletes so we'll, uh, we'll put some details up for them because they've hooked us up we'll, if you if you look we'll post some photos because there is a there is a, there's a significant amount of beef which is going to get eaten <laughs> around this table <laughs> in about like an you hour you killed the dinosaur <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what has ribs like that I'm excited <laughs> um, and now I'm sure every single person watching this will know exactly what Ross uh, some of the incredible things he's done the journey he's been on as, a, as an athlete adventurer as you call yourself now um, is, but, is there anybody else in the world who names themselves as an athlete adventurer is that is that is that I think it's a bit weird yeah because yeah, he trademarked that do you think I should yeah, I like it so. before, the, before this goes out <laughs> <laughs> yeah because it's weird isn't it it's kind of a you know a hybrid, you know, I'm not an adventurer. I always say that there's not going to be mountains named after me, but equally, I'm not, I'm not going to see, you know, be at the Olympics. Challenge you and Bear Grylls are a fight. Oh, no. <laughs> I'd put money on him, he's a badass. He's got knife <laughs> skills. He's, I'd be like, <laughs> he's actually at special forces. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what what, what no, am I going to do with my left wrist degree? <laughs> Sit on him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but for the one person watching that might not know who Ross Edgley is, in like what, in give us the like the fast version of like your journey, yeah. you know, particularly through fitness and whatnot, to get to this point. Yeah. So, so like real short, it was just kind of uh, I used to sort of swim and, and and play water polo internationally, but built like a hobbit. So a five foot nine. You know, my coach was like Ross. You know, you need to grow or find another sport. So what sort of age were you when you were doing that? So yeah, so, so I was playing internationally in the men's squad at sixteen, and and I'm just I'm, I'm still waiting for my growth spurt now. You know? <laughs> and the and the other big call up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So your arms were that big when you were sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> I never got the call up, and I never grew. Uh, so I ended up studying sports science. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So I just became very round and uh, yeah, studied sports science, uh, Loughborough University and, and kind of really became fascinated with how you could manipulate your physiology, kind of very similar to you guys, you know, sports background, but then you wanted to look at the, the systematic strength and conditioning of the human body, like human optimization mm. basically. And then uh, I started doing that, but then I just kind of got a little bit bored with conventional sport. So then I ended up, you know, as you guys know, I ran a marathon, pulling a car, uh, climbed a rope, uh, the height of Everest, uh, and and then it's just it keeps getting weirder every year. And then so last year, sw well, swam. I was going to swim from Martinique to Saint Lucia, which is forty kilometers, towing a hundred pound tree. The currents were so bad, and I couldn't find the beach. That I ended up swimming a hundred kilometers with a hundred pound tree, and I still couldn't find the beach. Uh, but I found out a lot about the human body in the process. So that's that's kind of it, and that's why I always say athlete adventurer because it's you're not just an adventurer, but you're also Exploring your body? That's yeah. a bit weird. No. That's a bit so, weird. You know, we, do, we do a lot of body exploration. Like we're we're the same sort of thing in terms of the calisthenics is like, well what can I do? Like what am I gonna to do to be able to achieve that? Like you're you have a penchant for ridiculous endurance events. Like yeah. Jack and I are less so. Um but I think it's the process of exploration of understanding of like actually I want to do something which I don't know if I can do, but I want to go through the process to understand yeah. how. And along that way you go, actually, not that it's not hard but you just enjoy that. For me, I enjoy the, the problem solving nature of it. Yeah. And I think ours, we get quite geeky about like lever lengths and yeah. weight distribution, that sort of stuff. I think yours is probably more around like understanding the, the psychology and the, 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 um, the conditioning component. And yeah. like uh, some of the stuff that I've seen you, 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 you talked about, and you've done like right back, some of the things I'm quite interested in to go back to the beginning is like you've traveled to some quite interesting places and how those sorts of things came about. You've spent time with, with some really interesting people and a lot of that's, that knowledge has kind of shaped how you think. So there's that side of stuff that I think is, is, is shapes you as, as an athlete adventurer, but then also like I see you crawling across mud flats because you, like one of it is good content, right? <laughs> <laughs> but two, like you're doing that because you're, you're exploring the, some of the most brutal ways in which you can develop mental toughness to yeah. then give you the skills that you need to go and achieve 
yeah. these incredible feats of yeah. athleticism. That's such a good point because I think uh, for, for so long sports science felt that your physiology was the limiting factor so we'd look at you and go right let's take you know a marathon for instance and we'll be like right we are going to monitor what your potential marathon time will be we'll look at lactic threshold vo2 power to weight ratio all of these sorts of things running biomechanics everything yeah. and at the end we'll go right okay cool tim you can run you know three hours you know mm. sub two hours you know you know world record <laughs> um, you know you are physically able bang but that was always looking at physiology. And then what I found really interesting, Tim Noakes in the central governor theory, but there's been a lot of research on it, was saying that fatigue is an emotionally driven state that basically gets you to kind of like pull the handbrake a little bit because it's going, whoa, whoa, this is horrible. You know, don't do, don't do yourself damage. Mm-hmm. And we'd have all experienced this. If you have run a marathon or, you know, even like 10K or anything like that, you'll all know that there becomes a point where um, you're like, oh my God, I can't go on. This is horrible. This is absolutely killing me. But you know, when you get to the finish line and all of a sudden your family's there and you know, your kids cheering you on. And you know, <laughs> exactly, all of a sudden, you know, you are Usain Bolt, your biomechanics change, you know, you are upright, you know, your cadence all of a sudden just, and, and it's like, well, where did that come from? And it's because your brain was telling you, whoa, hold up, hold up, you know. Yeah. And it was just, it's self-preservation. You know, your brain is telling your body, oh, oh, this is horrible, don't go on. And what's amazing is I found when you look at people like Emil Zatopek, so widely considered to be the greatest endurance athlete ever, uh, winning two gold medals, one Olympics, Helsinki, I think it was, never ran a marathon before. Um, so I think it was the 10,000 he'd already ran. And he, i do a terrible check, uh, accent, so I apologise for any of your checklists, but he, he was like, he goes, look, I, it turns to Scotia, he goes, I want to run marathon, and they were like, but you've never run a marathon before, but he came from a military background, mm-hmm. and he was just like, no, but I know how to run, mm-hmm. and I know how to just like be comfortable in the hurt locker, and they were like, well, what do you propose to you do, and he goes, look, he goes, show me who is going to win, and the favourite, and I will sit on his shoulder, and I will overtake him at the end. It's simple. <laughs> and they were just like, but you've never had okay. to. Yeah, and they were like, all right, fine. And that's exactly what he did. It was a British guy, he sat on his shoulder, and it's amazing. This British guy. Oh, it was, <laughs> this, and it was amazing. I forget his name now, it's going to annoy me, but the British guy, he's, he's, you know, he's old now, and there was this, this video, and he was looking back, talking about Emile Zatopek, and he was very, very sort of English gentleman, and he said, uh, he goes, I never forget. He goes, I was running and I was, you know, really struggling and Emil Zatopek came up on my shoulder and uh, he said, uh, he goes, I, I have never run marathon before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this isn't the Olympic oh, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he goes, I, so I don't know. He goes, is this, is this good? Is it too slow? And I, and the English guy goes, I thought you, you bugger. <laughs> said, uh, I'm going to stitch you up here. So he said, uh, so I turned to him and I said, oh no, you know, Emil, this is far too slow. You know, they're going to catch us behind. And with that, Emil Zatopek turned to him and he goes, okay, no problem, I see you would finish. <laughs> and he did, and he, Emil Zatopek went on the run and, and won it. But it was because of his military background, and, and Emil Zatopek was also known for pioneering interval training. So he used to run 100, 400 meter sprints. Yeah, so when you next think about hill sprints and everything, think of Emil Zatopek and just taking it to that level. Um, his wife was a renowned javelin thrower as well, and one of their favourite workouts that they used to do for fun, she would launch a javelin and he, like a dog, would run and go and catch it and <laughs> hand it back to her. That was for fun. He used to run in military boots. So like in terms of like biomechanics and understanding forefoot placement, heel striking, everything like that, he used to just run in military boots. Mm. So the one thing about Emil Zatopek, and I think this is one thing that, that I try and do is he just understood how to hurt and be comfortable and I think if you can do that it doesn't matter what your sport you know you trying to break a world record for a handstand are you trying to hold a you know the human flag for the longest hour are you running a marathon are you doing an ultra are you doing an Ironman it doesn't matter if you know how to hurt and just get comfortable being uncomfortable you know you, you can yeah. potentially win at any sport there's a lot in that like what we talk about redefining your impossible like a lot of the things that you're trying to do people will say is impossible and your body shouldn't be able mm. to do it and I'm still looking at your arms and I'm going how are they that big when all he does is like swim <laughs> <laughs> but we work we work but, swimming and I have done for quite a, a number of years and I, I know the sets that the guys do and they're, they're not trying to swim the distances you're trying to swim but I, I know a guy who was a 1500 meter swimmer Graham Smith who, who won a medal in Atlanta um, and he he, his total volume for a week would be sort of like maybe, a, I don't know, they were doing 10K, maybe 
pushing up towards 100, like you're pushing volumes similar to what the guys would be to go and swim 1500 meters at the, yeah. at the Olympics. And like our guys are maybe go and do a week and they might they'll, they'll hit half the volume yeah. that, you're, that you're training. Yeah. Um, but they're training for 400 meters. So you then start to argue about specificity and that sort of stuff. But still, like, the amount of volume that you're able to pack in yeah. is impressive. Yeah. What um, was the first one? Was it, was it the carpool? Was that the first? It was, one? yeah. And I, and I think. What inspired that? Well, essentially, work capacity. So, so you know, within, within the book, um, coming out 10th of May. Um, <laughs> we, we, we oh, so, so glad you asked. <laughs> so within the book, um, yeah. we were talking about this earlier, that, that I do systematically identify laws that every athlete should do. And one is, is the law of more. So work capacity, your body's ability to perform and positively tolerate training of a given intensity and duration. And it doesn't matter if that is, you know, marathon training, powerlifting, it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, your body's ability to just go, yeah, you know, I can cope with that and positively adapt. You know, if we all again were training for an ultra marathon, a hundred mile ultra marathon, and we had a month to do it, and we all set off and ran a marathon tomorrow just to give us a good start, you know, some of us would just be on the sofa afterwards going, what was that? I'm in pieces. And other people would be like, I hurt, but I can recover and, and, and go again. And I think, um, yeah, this, this idea of work capacity and, and the law of more is just you know, your, your body's ability to, you know, perform, but, but positively tolerate it. But looking at ways to do that, it's not just about throwing stimuli at the body. And one thing that, that I've always found is with swimming, with the world's strongest marathon, it's looking at something of like work capacity and crazy volume, yeah. but it's actually a lot of concentric contractions. So if you think of swimming for the lats, for the arm pull, it's all a concentric contraction. There's nothing eccentric. It's not like yeah, when yeah. you're running, yeah. if you're running downhill and your yeah, quads and your no hands. Yeah. Exactly, and it's exactly the same with sled drags. You know, it's all concentric contractions. And, a, and pulling a car is just a very large sled drag. Yeah, yeah. So after 26.2 miles of pulling a 1.4 ton car, everyone was like, oh, you must have been in pieces afterwards. And it was like, no, because it was all concentric contractions. Mm -hmm. And because I developed over those, those 10 weeks a, a way of training that I was absolutely fine. You trained 10 weeks for that? Yeah, and then, and then the day after, I just ran a half marathon as well, just to mm -hmm. sort of, out of my own curiosity, just was like, out. yeah, I was like, oh no, my legs still work. And I think it's the same with, with swimming, that yes, it is a lot of volume. And when people go, that's crazy, I'm like, yeah, but it, it would be very different if I was running it. You know, I'm sort of 95 yeah. kilos, built like a hobbit. If I'm running downhill, my legs, you know, just that eccentric contraction, mm. the, the impact, yeah. you know, going through each foot, you, you put about three times your own body weight through each foot. So going downhill, it's just like, you know, on, on a big descent, that's like doing, yeah. you know, 200 eccentric squats. Yeah. And that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. But with swimming, especially long distance, it's all aerobic. You know, I'm never out of breath. It's all concentric contractions. So looking at something like training for three hours and smashing, you know, sort of 15K, people go, whoa, that's crazy. I'm like, but when you actually look at the science of that 15K, yeah. low impact, non-weight mm. bearing, concentric all aerobic yeah i've got a thing about swimming that i'm interested from a mindset perspective like I, I quite i never done a lot of swimming and then when i started working with the with the paralympic team i um we were on training camps so there's obviously 50 meter there's a there's long course 50 meter swimming pools there and i was like i'm going to start swimming because i don't really know what these guys are going through mm -hmm. and i'm not conditioned for it at all and what i found was from like i'm not really the right shape of swimming like you but i'm just a smaller version obviously yeah. <laughs> But like the elite swimmers that I see, they just don't have a similar, they don't have the same build. But I thought I'd give this a go, but I was so deconditioned for it that I was like, I would swim 25 meters and my lats and my shoulders were in bits. But I kind of pushed through it. My first set was like, I'm gonna do a thousand meters. That mm -hmm. is like what I'm gonna aim at. And that was like hard. And then mm -hmm. I, was, I was training with a girl who actually done a lot of swimming. We used to be a very good swimmer. She has to do a kick set. And I literally couldn't kick 25 meters because my hip flexors were in bits. Mm -hmm. But you start going, well, actually, like, like I've never trained like that. My, mm -hmm. my, my sports background was all field based. Yeah. But you realize how badly conditioned you are for some of these sorts of tasks. But I got better mm -hmm. at it. Yeah. But I remember, like, I was, I, I was some long course for the first time, 50 meters. And I was with one of the guys who was the head coach at the time, was, um, was an ex uh, very high level international level swimmer. And I was like, I did long course today. And he goes, it's. 
because it's awful, isn't it? I was like, yeah, I got halfway, and I was like, crack it. <laughs> like, and then Kyle, I told Kyle, my wife, and I was like, I've swam long course for the first time to get shot. Do you go to Tumbleton? I was like, you flipping kidding. Like, I had to arrest when I got to the end. But it, it made me realise that, I, and I read at the same time I was reading a book by um, uh, Chris McDonald, I think I've got the name right, called Natural Born Heroes, and it came oh, up this yeah, idea, yeah, and I read yeah, a blog yeah. about it, around hero training, and if I needed to swim for my life, could I? And I was like, no. Like I would drown. Yeah. So having this like this this um, base level of the sorts of things that you're able to do is like you can do a triathlon, yeah. you can swim, you can pull a car. Like I, I think that having that athletic ability and diversity in your training, yeah. and you can bench press however much you got strength training in there, yeah. is a, is a is a thing that we can learn a lot from. Like I look at my training and go, I'm missing a massive part of it. And there's a number of different reasons we can't do everything all the time because of yeah. circumstance. But I, I do think that that, that you take it to the extreme, yeah. but what your general sort of person like who's just involved in fitness, having that array or that, that foundation of different mm. attributes, and that's something that which you cover in, the, in your book, mm. about actually going back to first principles of fitness. Tell us a bit about it, because there's some amazing information in there. Mm. Like what's the concept behind it, um, and what are you try, what's the big sort of message that you're trying to get across? It, it, it's very similar, because I know we all, uh, we geek out when we all catch up <laughs> over barbecue ribs. <laughs> but we, we, it's basically, I, I was sitting there going, how could you systematically train the body, the human body? So it's, I wanted to create almost like a user's guide for the body. It's like you're given a body, how do you use it? And, and I know we were talking about this, Jacko, like so many people when they're in the gym, you know, they'll go in and they'll kind of go, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do bicep curls. Oh no, I forgot to squat, I forgot to do my legs. Oh cool, you're on the, uh, on, on the cross trainer. Yeah, I'm a bit of cross training there. Air bike, wee. And it's just like on a cellular level, what signal are you trying to send your body to adapt to? This is all over the place. And so it was really to bring some clarity. A lot of what's in the book, I mean, human biology hasn't changed for thousands of years. We've known about this, you know, the laws of thermodynamics, when you start looking at your diet, you know, macronutrients, everything. It's, it's all been there, but no one's ever put it into this, this framework, a cohesive framework. And so with this, I almost say it's like a literary buffet in that, like, once you read it, you can go, I want to get strong. Brilliant. There's a whole chapter. Andy Bolton, the first guy to deadlift a thousand pounds, helped me write that chapter. Mm. I want to get quick, you know, next month. You know, we were saying, have a clear direction. Mm. Cool. I documented everything that I learned from Linford Christie to Loughborough University and everything. You know, there, there is no better coach really mm. than someone like Linford Christie. Um, I want to learn about endurance. Brilliant. It documents all of my time with the Sam Bushman where we were running in Africa over an ultra marathon a day. And then I came back as well and started to learn from a lot of uh, fell runners like my friend James Atherton, who's world obstacle racing champion. So it's like you've, you've taken like this melting pot of genius which says, I know what we always get on, and that's what we throw around. I'm like, imagine if you could just create an athlete who understood body weight conditioning like you guys, endurance like the Sam Bushman, you know, the, and, and, and compile that all into a book. And for 10 years, like I said, it's, it's taken me 10 years. I think it was Orwell who said, you know, how dare you sit down and write when you haven't stood up and lived. Mm. And so that's why people are like, why is it taking you 10 years? And I'm like, because that's, I mean, when I handed it in, it was 200,000 words. And they were like, this is ridiculous. We commissioned you for 70. And I was like, well, I've got a lot to say. <laughs> you know, so we've had to completely, you know, sort of uh, get it down and condense it into this, this framework. Um, but... Uh, and this is certainly how I, I came to learn about you guys at the very start, that if you, if you imagine a, a pyramid of priority, as I call them, so this hierarchical way to run your body, so it doesn't matter if your goal is strength, speed, stamina, there'll always, always be something at the base of your pyramid that you should start with. Mm. So we were talking about this because, um, you know, for those listening and probably seen on videos, Tim possesses an unbelievable handstand push-up. <laughs> it's just obscene. <laughs> so to get strong, it's like, what must you do? But then you were saying that your military press, it, it felt a bit weird, it mm. felt a bit different. So absolutely, in terms of that strength pyramid of priority, strength is a skill. People don't realize yeah. that. You have to drill the movement. There's no point putting loads of weight on the bar when you're just drilling bad biomechanics. If you've got good genetics and raw strength, you might be able to muscle your way through certain movements, but there'll be a, come a time when you just completely plateau. Mm. <clears throat> and, and it starts to look at then work capacity. So again, coming back to the fact that, okay, if we're designing a program for you and we say, right, you want to get good on deadlifts, cool, you know, 10 sets of 10, German volume training, and then all of a sudden your body's going, well, what was that? It's like, well, you yeah. didn't have the work capacity to, to tolerate. 
celebrate that. And then we even covered that today when we were talking about um, there will be a point where neurologically you're recruiting all the muscle fibers. We've all seen it, to put it in sort of simple terms, you know, those sort of quite lean, smaller guys who are insanely strong. Climbers. I like that. Exactly. Climbers is the best example. Yeah. You know, neurologically, they're recruiting all of their muscle fibers, you know, possible, and they are inc like st stupidly strong. And then they'll get, you know, some guys who are huge, but not very strong in proportion to how big they are. Mm. And that's all around their strength deficit. And there becomes a point where if you are looking to get stronger, if you can honestly say, like, neurologically, I'm using my full potential of my muscles, yeah then muscular hypertrophy is, mm -hmm. is your sort of only other option. You need to get bigger. It's like almost like you need a bigger engine in your car. Yeah. Just as simple as that. And again, I, I think what's nice about the book is, is it gets people to think outside of that. It's just, you know, hypertrophy is not, it's not a bad word. You know, boy, it's bodybuilding. Oh, I'm trying to get bigger so I can get stronger yeah. at, you know, body weight conditioning. That's, that's all. It doesn't make me a bodybuilder. Yeah. And we were just talking about this as well. Yeah, okay. People are like want, yeah, wanting labels. I mean, that's probably going to get a little bit, <coughs> a bit, bit too deep outside, yeah, outside of fitness. Like, but <coughs> so people wanting to like, we almost want a label. Like, I'm a, I'm a bodybuilder, or I'm a calisthenics, or mm. I'm, a, I'm a this, I'm a that. And now, I when I played rugby, I was like, I'm a rugby player. Yeah. And it's like, well, what happens when that's taken away? And that's not the. What's the reason? What's the why behind your training? You're doing what you're doing. It was. You know, one of my first questions I'd feel like, why, like these crazy things you're doing, like why are you doing, like what's mm. the reason behind it? It's mm. the same question that the, the, the example you gave in the, of someone in the gym going from one thing to the next thing and then I was the squat and the, yeah. like, they don't know, they don't know why, they don't know where they're going. Yeah. Like what's the reason for it? I remember a guy had, um, it reminded me of being at, uh, when I was at Loughborough at two training and there was a guy who'd done uh, like a massive chest bench session before the day the day before, and then he wanted to come to the gym with us, and he was like, "Oh, what are you doing?" I was like, "Oh, we're doing chest as well." He's like, "Yeah, right, I'll do chest as well." It's just like <laughs> day to day, back to back. Just the, the, the why was like the why was because my mates are doing that session, yeah, and I quite like bench, yeah, yeah. But not like I'm trying to. He was a rugby player. He was a harlequin. It's like he should have been trying to improve himself. Uh, physically for the for the for that purpose, but it was sort of lost. And I think a lot of us. We all go through that, and I think that, yeah, as a general sort of, if I'm, if I'm just, um, I'm not a professional athlete. I'm just like my training, and, and I know it's good for me to work out and, and stay mm -hmm. fit and healthy. Like having, having understanding why are you doing it, and what are your sort of goals, and it's good to have goals. Like yeah. that can really help, sort of not just motivate you, but channel your energy and your time, and, and so you're being effective with your training. But yeah, I, I think. Um, you know, on, on the idea of actually, you know, being so easily influenced and jumping from one thing to the other and understanding like, you know, am I a bodybuilder? Am I a sprinter? And, stuff? and I think that's what's so nice about the, the book. It was so heavily influenced by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, who uh, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, if you teach a man principles, he can create his own methods. And I think there are so many methods out there, diet plans and workouts that you are expected to, to blindly follow, like, you know, to use mm. strength training, you know, German volume training, you know, five by five. And, you know, these are all methods. They're great. But if you learn principles, so as we were talking about, let's stick with, you know, increasing muscle mass. So, you know, the three principles of increasing muscle mass, you know, hypertrophy, mechanical tension, metabolic stress and muscle damage. If you learn those three principles, it doesn't matter about the workout because you understand how to actually create your yeah. own. I think we, we, we probably frustrate people sometimes because we get a lot of questions. And when you come from an SNC background and you've developed programs, you've always got that goal at the end of, sort of working towards something and it's a season long, or for us it's actually four years long is the cycle that we're prepping for. And people are like, should I do this exercise or should I do that? Or how should I go about training for a handstand? And we're like, well, it depends what you want. And yeah. there's so many times, how many times yeah. do we questions yeah. go, well, the answer is, it depends. <laughs> and you feel yeah. bad because you want to give them a really yeah. simple answer. I want to answer. tell you, but the truth yeah. but is, like, it depends. Yeah. And, and we can't hide that, even though it's frustrating to hear that, probably. Yeah, it's exactly that. So, again, uh, you know, the, he was an economist, but one of my favourite authors, um, Nassim Taleb, you know, one of my favourite quotes of his was, um, you know, as humans facing limited knowledge or as resort to prescribed ideas and narratives. And it's so true. He didn't mean that for fitness at all, but it's so true. As humans facing limited knowledge, so when we don't really understand how to train, how to diet, 
we resort to these prescribed ideas and narratives. So we just want to be told, oh, that's the workout I'm doing today. Yeah. But that's just not how it works. It's not <coughs> optimal. It, it, you know, it will, it will be like a comfort blanket. And you'll go like, oh yeah, I, you know, I'll just follow this diet. But you don't understand the principles. Yeah. So it will come unstuck. Don't you yeah. think that our access to information today, like technology and, and our fingertips and the, the prevalence of people's voices, but also um, the medium in which people have got, it's easy for people to communicate, has just completely clouded up. There would have been a time back in the day when we didn't have social media and the internet, where if you wanted to learn how to get bigger, you had to go and go to a library and get a book and read about it, or go and speak to somebody in the gym. And you didn't have, you might have one, you might have gone to the biggest dude in the gym and gone, help me to get bigger, or the thinnest person, whatever you were training for, yeah. the best marathon runner. Tell me what you've done, and that person will take you under the under the wing. And, and to be fair, that was probably some of where the bro science started to come from. Mm. But actually, oh, you were indoctrinated, or you were following one person's thought process, which actually probably yielded quite good results. But whereas now you can follow, well, an unlimited number of different people's ideas, and people have interpreted fitness and their mm. their different what their theories are around it. So all of a sudden, I think it's become a massively complicated thing, and that's what we've tried to do with our framework, is gone, these are the principles that you need to understand if you're gonna learn any calisthenics movement. So you need to prepare for the session you're gonna do, you gotta teach yourself the skill component, you've gotta get specifically strong, and you've gotta just build that engine of mm. capacity strength. Mm. It doesn't matter if it's a pistol, squat, or a muscle, mm. same principles. Mm. And then you've just got to, you, you've got to be, there's a little bit of art in that about which exercises are you going to use and understanding what your body is currently able to do and where your weak links are. Mm. You made a comment before about my shoulders. I was actually reflecting on the way home a little bit about it and I was going, I started to learn to handstand because I'd got a bad shoulder mm. and because it dislocated and I had surgery on it and it was, it was that was the means, the reason was if I could handstand my shoulder stable. Um, the irony of that is, and I think it's probably, from a lot of cases, yours is probably similar, but you then turn that into your biggest strength. It's actually the thing that I'm best at, kind of sense, yeah, which is yeah, actually yeah. started with the thing that I was weakest with, at when yeah. I began. Mm. And I just think that that's probably aside from the point of the, the exposure that we've got to a massive amount of information well, that people get confused and they don't, actually don't know what they're doing anymore. It's that's not, what I love about your book, yeah. is you've gone back to first principles of fitness. Yeah, because, it's not, because it's not, these things aren't black and white, like there's more than one way um, to get strong, for example. Yeah. And mm. And in the past, before the internet, and if you, if it's before the internet, before social media, if you were going to read something, it was published, mm. it was a paper. It's no one can just write what they want, mm. and it get passed by through to actually going to print. So mm. there's been a uh, there's been a like a consensus that this information is valid, mm. and therefore it's been published in a research paper, for example. Mm. Whereas now I can write a blog, mm. and I can write whatever I want. It could be a load of tosh, but people might believe me mm. and it makes it more it's already confusing without that and then it just makes it so much more yeah. but there are confusing. countless examples of people that are putting out information like that and they sound like they they, they talk the talk mm. but when actually when 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 you look at it and we've we've benefited from a, a number of years in the game and you've, you've actually got some context to put that under mm. it looks convincing but you dig into it and you're like i don't know this yeah. is I'm not sure, and, and, and we have to challenge ourselves and go, well, maybe you're seeing things differently. What can I learn from that? And mm. you are constantly critiquing as we do with, with research papers. Mm. But there are some things, that, that, and that's what I, as I go back to what I like what you've put in the book, is actually nobody in sports science is going to argue. Mm. And actually you've gone back and gone, yeah, these are the laws and the principles that we mm. need to follow if you're going to create a physical adaptation with the level of understanding that we currently have about the human body. Yeah. It's not to say that that's not going to change and we can't tweak it, but those things, that, like you say, have been around for a long time. Yeah. They've been tried and tested by athletes in all different endeavours, yeah. sports, recreation, whatever. Just stick to those. And the, and the thing is, like, a lot of the extreme cases, like you're an extreme case of what you would do, but for 99% of people, actually we just need to follow some really simple, basic yeah. principles. And they're all the same. That's what I find as well, that the, the laws that I've identified in the book have been around for thousands of years. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you want to take them to the extreme like me, you know, so the law of more and, 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 and you know, work capacity, it will be exactly the same for a beginner. And we address that in the book. Mm. So I say, if you're a beginner, amazing. You know, I was like, oh my God, I'd love to be a beginner again. Because <laughs> can you remember, like every week you'd put on like muscle, like you'd, you know, your oh, bench, know would, <laughs> you know, like your, your bench press would just go up like, you know, five kg, you know, your rate of improvement was this, yeah. you know, and we say that, you know, and then, 
But again, pyramid of priority within the book, like to take strength for an example, you know, as you move up, so you've learned the skill, you have the work capacity, you have the adequate amount of muscle mass, and we start moving up, that's when you can start to look at bands, chains, looking mm. at your rate of force development, and you can start to get real creative with this. But that's at the top of the priority. You know, you, you can't do this until you've got the base of the pyramid set. And it's exactly the same with, with everything. But I love what you said there, Tim, and, and that's what I said about the book, that I want to create an army of experts, not followers, mm. because you will be your own best expert. So looking at uh, Eugene Sandow, you know, the father of bodybuilding, if you've, uh, if you've ever read um, any of his, his books, it's, it's written in sort of ye old English, so it's kind of hard to follow and stuff. But what's amazing, and I've sat through so many pages of it, and that, that's covered in the book, but he believed in just self-empowerment. So there was, and there's, I'm going to butcher it, but he talks about this one point where he says, you know, I, I just often asked, you know, when thy best time to train, and, <laughs> you know, and when the moon sets in the sky, and it goes up on one, but basically saying, like, I'm often asked when the best time to train is. And then he starts going off on one, but he's intricately talking about hormones and the circadian rhythm and your body's 24 hour biological mm. clock. Now your circadian rhythm, everything and physiological, everything like this, and how testosterone is higher in the morning, dips in the night. We all understand that now, but what Eugene Sandow was talking about, an 18th century strongman, the father of bodybuilding, was still true. It's mm. exactly the same. We've just got nice terms now and we'll apply it and you can say it and sound really clever. But it doesn't mean that, you know, what Eugene was de describing was exactly the same. Yeah. And what I love about the book and what I encourage everybody to do is it, Aristotle, uh, and I, I, he, he basically, uh, the, the term is an epistemocrat and it's, it's, he wanted everybody to hold knowledge, including their own, in such kind of, uh, suspicion you know so just question everything be a critical thinker and at the end of the book I say you know question this book question me question yourself question everyone because um, that's the only way that you'll you know ask questions you, I bet your best students are those who say like why yeah you know, why am I doing this because you go oh but you know let me tell you why yeah. and that's what I want from from this book that there are workouts in there there's workouts for every single goal you could ever want to achieve lose fat you know the recipes are amazing you know to build muscle uh, develop speed improve endurance but the reality is once you've read all 320 pages of it you can actually write your own and that's what i want people yeah. to do i'm like this is here is a workout but please adapt it to your own biological individual that's what we do all the yeah. time we've always been fighting with our like our, like we'll and you see it with all the graduates and we love we love them when they come through and they've learned the thing that they're working towards the goal they've set themselves there impossible and uh the, the guys to take people through them um, some people find it difficult that we haven't actually just gone oh, on day one you do this and day two this and three this because it's just not realistic because yeah. we have no everyone's day one is different yeah. and everyone progresses at a different rate so trying to educate people to be able to like understand like you say understand the why and what you're doing and then be able to write your own program I think some people think oh well I paid you to write it mm. but actually giving you the information to write yours program this one and the next one and for infinity yeah. isn't that worth more than just having one that runs yeah. out in six weeks yeah because yeah. Ralph was on week number seven yeah. that's what we always say yeah. Yeah. Like if you don't know if you like you say if you haven't got the, the, the ability to write your own training program you haven't got the principles you can't create your own methods actually you then just become reliant and I think that's part I of the problem I get it I understand why people I are totally like, get it yeah. get a bit frustrated by that yeah. like, but your yeah. tendency is then to, to, to jump around a little bit and actually yeah. I think if you if you if you Took, and if people took a little bit of time to read, uh, 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 you've written it really well. Like anybody could pick that up and read. You don't have to be a sport scientist to read a book. <laughs> Not just <laughs> looking at the pictures. <laughs> it's Lexi <Lexington. laughs> But if, if people took the time to to, to, to ed educate themselves in a way which is which is easily accessible, you've still got the option to go around and go, which training modality do I like? I like your style. I like what you're trying to teach. It might be calisthenics. It might be bodybuilding. It might be powerlifting. But when you're in that, you're actually understanding the bigger picture of where yeah. that sits. Yeah. There's one I, thing I just wanted to touch on about. He's talking about like 18th century people talking about bodybuilding. I look back at, at, the, at this, the old circus strongmen, and like we've seen some photos of calisthenics back in like the early 1900s late 1800s yeah. those dudes were huge, huge. Yeah. we've seen pictures of these guys who are probably 15 16 17 stone and the one guy doing a single arm handstand on top of his other mate who's about 18 stone and the only reason he's on the bottom is because he's a stone lighter <laughs> <laughs> but he's not a small dude like 
and we're just looking we're going like people got strong people were functional and yeah we could, because there's probably a much bigger concepts of that but they arguably knew less mm. but did more with it yeah whereas we know loads yeah. and i think i i, I even i, I over complicate my training sometimes i don't train hard enough because i'm like oh, i'm doing this complicated thing like <laughs> yeah. i don't and i don't put enough work in sometimes mm. to get and then i go oh, i've changed but actually there's two basic principles do work Training yeah, intensity. Yeah, yeah. Challenged by that today, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> on set with Ross now, I'm like, I've wasted 10 years. Why am I not even bigger? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's why. He's behind you, pulling you like, to a failure. When he said five more, we were just doing this drop set, and we were in Tim's face, Tim had squeezed out his last rep. And Ross went behind him and went, five more. And he heard this, what? <laughs> and then collapsed on the floor. Nice. At that point, I was doing handstands on, uh, sorry, I was doing push ups on my knees. <laughs> But you're always so right, I'm, and and that is again within the book, the law of progressive overload, yeah. and 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 I detail that, and I wrote that entire chapter from the uh, the Royal Marines as well. That was just the one thing that the Royal Marines understand is stress and stimuli. Yeah. You know that you are only going to get fitter, stronger, quicker. It doesn't matter from stress and stimuli. 1936, Hans Selye. You know he coined that general adaptation syndrome, and it's just like it's going to be uncomfortable. And I think now. You know, it's marketable to say it's easy, this isn't gonna hurt, you can mm. vibrate yourself fitter, <laughs> you know, take yeah, this yeah. pill, it's easy, you know, stuff. And it's just like Get the fitter in 30 seconds a day. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Delve into the vibrate yourself fitter. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that a different podcast? <laughs> if it, do you know what the Royal Marines is like the PTIs, they are foremost experts at stress and stimuli. And it goes back to that. It just goes back to exactly that. That you can you can you can have all the knowledge in the world, but unless you apply it with, you know, I mean looking at again like Dorian Yates and his high intensity training, if you've ever seen some of the videos, you're like, oh, that's what it takes to grow muscle mass. You know, it's the same. You look at some of the gymnasts we were talking about, you know, Sam Oldham, you know, a friend of mine, he's just I remember when I was talking about the pommel horse and, and I was like, oh, so how would you get good at this? Mm-hmm. And he was just like, oh, you know, when we were a kid, we would just get on there and they'd put our feet in a bucket, you know, mm-hmm. and then we would, they'd just leave us for 20 minutes. I was like, 20 minutes? So when you talk about time under tension <laughs> yeah. and stuff, it's like they would just leave you in a bucket and they were like, yeah, just swing in. And it's like, what? Mm. So for all of the intricacies of let's break down, it's like, no, put your feet in a bucket and spin. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. just spend a lot of time from a young age doing it. Yeah, yeah. it's exactly that. Ross, I want to touch on um, so one of the sections you put around bodyweight training in the book. So I'm interested how you see it fitting into uh, the bigger picture. And there's particularly the bit that you talk about around mechanical energy. Just talk about mechanical energy and then how you see... Um, bodyweight training being a benefit around that concept and feeding into whatever else it is you want to do from there onwards. Yeah, so uh, looking again at this this pyramid of priority, so if, if you're listening on the podcast, kind of imagine you know this pyramid, and you've got the five laws, and, and the very first law is the law of body basics. You know, calisthenics, body weight conditioning, and it doesn't matter what you want to train for, what sport you want to train for, where you are on your journey, it doesn't matter. You need to understand how to move your body weight before you even think about running a marathon, because running a marathon is a bodyweight exercise, you know? Uh, if you want to go and shift the barbell, you want to be a powerlifter, well, you better learn how to move your body before you move a barbell. It doesn't matter, you need to have this, this foundation, and, and this goes back to uh, a Soviet Union uh, training principle. I mean, you know, Soviet Union sporting principles, you know, one of the greatest sporting successful nations. I mean, obviously, you know, a few ergogenic aids and a few things. <laughs> <laughs> those yeah. revelations, I don't know. There has, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and you know, I, it would be wrong of me not to sort of, you know, point that out. But when you look at people like Verka Shansky, who, you know, uh, pioneered plyometrics and the depth jump, um, you know, he, that was during the time. So the depth jump, for those people, uh, you know, not familiar, he, you basically, you know, you... St- Vokish Chansey understood that if you wanted to jump on a, uh, you know, do an ordinary box jump or, you know, uh, uh, you were doing a long jump, that um, if you were to jump from another box, land and use that kinetic energy, so you land, your quadriceps, your hamstrings, everything bend, elastic energy, eccentric contraction, that the concentric contraction, so as you jump, is more powerful. He understood that during a time when all other athletes around the world at the Olympics were like touching their toes and you know doing jumping jacks and you know that's how pioneering he was and so so sort of yeah going back to how the Soviet uh, sort of sporting nation understood how to take an athlete and make them amazing 
they understood what was general physical preparedness. So when you were a kid, you know, if, if, if I'm like a Soviet coach here and I've got, you know, a young Tim and a young Jacko standing in front of me, you know, fresh faced, five years old, goes, I want to be an Olympian. You know, and I'll be like, right, I don't know if you're going to be big, strong. I don't know if you're going to have like stupid strong shoulders or an amazing flag. I don't know because you're just kids. So what I'm going to do is this, this idea of general physical preparedness. I'm going to get you to crawl, run, jump, mm. pull-ups, you know, calisthenics, yeah. body weight conditioning. And what that's going to do is lay such a strong neurological foundation that you understand how to move your body that later when we go, oh, hang on, you know, remember that kid Jacko? He's quite strong, you know, maybe you stick him into rugby, but he has the neurological capacity, yeah. he understands how, the work capacity as well, the law of more, yeah. everything with this work, he understands and he can then apply it to the law of specificity. And I think when, when, when we were kids, like what we used to do is we can go out and play all day, yeah. and like just mess about, play football, swing on trees, if you're doing that like via just mm. exploring the world and just your, well, your little world as a kid, if you know what I mean, but it's just exactly. naturally doing that um, it's exactly well, that that's being suppressed these days and I don't know well, I saw a guy in the UK SCA um, speaker um, Avery Fagenbaum and he was he, he flicked up a, a picture of a, a, an amazing kids play park and he, his big thing is around getting kids and, and, and youth development of bringing back athleticism bringing back basic fundamental movement skills and movement literacy in schools so actually we're, we're working with this youth population and junior population it's not all about top end because obviously we know if we build the youth the top end is going to get better anyway but he flicked up this great picture of play park and he goes if we build that in your neighborhood will the kids come and play and everyone was like yeah yeah it's amazing what a great play park to a room full of ssc coaches who would have flipping lights over go themselves yeah. um and he goes, no, the kids won't come because they're not strong enough to use it. And it's monkey bars and it's stuff to swing on and climb on. And he's just like, kids are not that physically able anymore. Wow. And then they throw, they, they, they contrast that with pictures of um, sort of high school, like gym classes or PE classes, physical education classes back in the day. And they're doing calisthenics. They're climbing ropes. Mm. They're swinging. Like it looks like gladiators are like, hanging tough, but we don't do that sort of stuff anymore. Mm. And we would look at that and go, hang tough, like swinging from one ring to the next. And we were like, that is single arm active hang, and it's the primary uh, movement that we use in shoulder stability. Yeah. Like now, we don't exactly touch that sort of yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that is uh, essentially, um, so body weight training or, or, or the law of body basics. Um, if I can, uh, open the world's fittest book. Um, and uh, sorry for those uh, listening on the podcast, I'll try my very best to kind of uh, sort of paint a picture uh, as you're listening. But if you imagine a, a pyramid of priority, so this is this goes back to you know your body's user guide, so how you can systematically program your body. Um, and at the very base of this is the law of body basics, which is just calisthenics, body weight training. So it, it goes back to um, a, a Soviet Union sporting principle. So you know one of the greatest sporting nations is um, obviously uh, possibly using uh, pharmaceutical yeah. uh, urbogenic aids. Uh, so <laughs> moving, but, moving on. <laughs> um, <Fair enough. laughs> but um, worth noting is is a lot of their principles that they were pioneering. So uh, the depth jump, Verkashansky, uh, one of the the probably the, the creator of plyometrics as we know it today, ballistic training, speed training, um, he came up with the depth jump and it was very simply, if you were to perform a box jump and you were to jump onto the box, he found out that by jumping from another box, so you land, store that kinetic energy, uh, eccentric contraction in the legs will then produce a more powerful concentric contraction so you'll be able to jump higher afterwards he was the one who actually pioneered that. And this was during a time when, you know, some of the world's best athletes were touching their toes and, you know, swinging their <laughs> arms and doing jumping jacks. And, and everyone was looking at these guys jumping off boxes going, what are the Soviet guys doing? Look at them. And they were jumping further, running faster than anyone else. Um, so sorry, to come back to that, so me mechanical energy, I state that the, the law of body basics forms the absolute base of this pyramid if you want to to, to systematically condition your body. You know, how do you become a better physical human? Mm. Um, and all that is, is just, you know, before you specialize in any sport, it doesn't matter if you are an expert, a beginner, male or female, it doesn't matter. You have to understand how to use your body because it's this mechanical energy. And, and it goes back to the Soviet principle of general physical preparedness. Um, so, you know, like I said, at the very base of the pyramid, if, if we were here, 
I was a Soviet Union coach and I had a, a young Jacko and, and a young Tim, you know, before me, five years old. And, you know, your parents handed them, you know, to me and said, train them to be future Olympians. And I'd be like, look, I don't know if he's, you know, Jacko's going to be big or small or Tim's going to be like quick or good at endurance. So what I'm going to do is teach them body basics, calisthenics, body weight conditioning, general, general physical preparedness. Doesn't matter what term, it's the same thing. I'm going to teach them to run, jump, crawl, pull-ups, mm. press-ups, squat, hit a full lunge, because they'll then develop this proprioception, kinesthetic awareness, they'll understand how to use and move their body to then lay a neurological foundation to specialise later, when we know that Jacko is going to be a beast, and it's like, okay, he's, he's becoming quite big, okay, send him into rugby, oh, you know, Tim, you know, he's going to be an amazing swimmer, you know, whatever he's going to be, you know, then we can specialise. But we can only specialise once they've developed, as I said, mechanical energy, proprioception, kinesthetic awareness, general physical preparedness, doesn't matter what you want to call it, it is the law of body basics. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's what we stress in the book, that you have to start with that. And, and I think now, I mean, you were touching upon, you know, even, even looking at, you know, kids nowadays. Yeah, you know. I don't want to be that like, like, oh, it's better when we were younger. It, like, it's <laughs> I just think that I look back and, like, the old school gyms, when, when I was at infant school even, like, we had a rope and we had, like, the wall bars and you would get on them and you would climb up them. And, and I think there's just a certain amount of, you, you see videos of it, of, of, like, high school PE and gym class. And it was just general, like I said, it was general pre preparation training. And they were, like, swinging on climbing ropes. And how many people can climb a rope these days? Like, it's not easy. Um, and they were doing that swinging from one ring to another and we would start that as like, well that's the foundation of our human flag train is actually built a single arm active hang and that's this, this foundation of scapular retraction, depression and, and shoulder stability and being able to do that and there's some really interesting thing about what happens when you're gripping, how that interacts with the shoulder, we're going back to these basics of their human, natural human movement patterns mm. but they're incorporated in exercise and I, I just think there's that, that says a lot for just building that foundation level. Whereas now, I, I don't know a huge amount of what happens in PE at infant school apart from what I hear, that actually probably not a huge amount of time dedicated towards mm. it. But it's more games based, but I think we've probably lost the strength component of it. And we play parts are now yeah. safe, aren't they? Because they don't want people to fall off stuff. Mm. So we did just play, like, yeah. and I don't, I don't know whether there is less of that now for various different reasons, but in, you know, we were we'd go out all all evening and come back for tea and that was you do whatever you want and a lot of that would be messing about and playing about and where the kids now do or don't have the opportunity to do that. I remember being we were in a in a queue to get on the ferry last year we were, I was mm. we, I was driving the, we had a retreat in um, Morsian and I had to drive mm. uh, to take all the equipment and we sat in the queue for the ferry and like everyone had been bored out there and the kids are climbing the walls in the cars and then. We just, a few of us like would get out of the car and then actually there was a, a family that had a few kids that there was just like a big pot, big bar um, across the road at like hip high and they were just they were skinning the cat yeah, yeah. they didn't know they were skinning the cat they were just playing they were trying to do a muscle bond and they were getting like they, they were just automatically I was looking at the cat I was like cat thing doing calisthenics <laughs> like I wanted to go and talk I wanted to go and coach them and train them and it was like no just let them explore and parents were like no she's not quite doing it right like yeah, you know, yeah. actually just let them play and explore they're having fun yeah. um and I think just giving people the opportunity to do that rather yeah. than, I guess, taking the opportunity. That is away. it. And, and, and in many ways, it happened by accident. Yeah, and with, and with the world's fittest book, it's just taking sometimes what happened by accident, but making you very aware of it. And they were having mm. fun. Yeah. They were smiling, they were enjoying, they were laughing. Like, yeah. That, and that's a great book. Never went, five more reps. Snow on the eccentric. <laughs> It's such a good point. Until, until I step <laughs> yeah. But it is looking even at adherence. So actual, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. sort of, and this is, you know, for everything that you can put down in theory, what happens in real life is sometimes very different. And, and genuinely, I'm not just saying it, but that's what I love about what you guys do in that, you know, because it is the school of candidates, but you teach people the principles so they're able to actually then go forth. And if something happens like, 
you know they've got to take the kids to school and that messes with their program mm. and they didn't manage to do the workout that day it's fine because yeah. they understand the principles they can just rewrite the method and yeah. rewrite the workout plan and it's fine it will still go on yeah. but it's those people and, and you know Ralph Waldo Emerson if, if you only understand principles you'll come unstuck and so those people who go, oh God, you know, I missed today's, you know, yeah, school of calisthenics, you know, yeah, yeah the, the, you know, the, the the human flag guide. I miss one day. What do I do? Do I start on day one? And it's just like, don't panic. I, yeah. I understand. And and genuinely, that's what I love about your guides. You know, once you've read it, you're equipped. Mm. You know, so what you do with it is up to you. And you yeah. can modify it. You know, and, it, and 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 that's what's so nice. I think when you're just touching on adherence, like enjoying what you do, like we all just laugh there when we like. When you're laughing, when you're smiling, when you're enjoying the things that you do, like everything else becomes easier. Adherence to it, your motivation to it. Like, in, I don't know how, how much of it you sort of touch on that within the book, but if you enjoy what you're doing, you're gonna you're gonna be so much more successful or happy yeah. at the end of it. I think there's I've, one of my things I can take away from today is, is that. There's, a, there's an opportunity there to start to, yes, we can specialise. We've taken the bodyweight basics to a, to a more extreme level. And not that it's like, extreme makes it sound like it's perilous. Extreme, we need to do it. Extreme, guys. <laughs> it's extreme because it's all we do. Um, but what I think, and you're actually much better than this at me than, than, than me, but um, I also need to have some time and create some space for the other things which I know that I, I enjoy when I get time to do them. Like, so it might be trying to get back into a bit of swimming. Because I liked, you know why I like swimming? Because it was hard. And it pushed me to do something which actually made me feel really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that swimming was actually really complementary to my calisthenics mm -hmm. because if my shoulders were getting tight and stiff, I could feel my stroke length mm -hmm. decreasing and actually getting into the water and driving out. It's almost like active stretching. If I'm not swimming at intensity, I'm just mm -hmm. driving out nice mm -hmm. distance per stroke, long stroke lengths. And I miss it. And I miss, I miss that hurt locker that you were talking mm -hmm. about before because when we train calisthenics, like we're neurally quite challenged and we're mentally quite challenged because we have endless frustrations we try to teach ourselves these different positions and moves and, and whatever else and it get we hit the plateaus and you can find yourself in a real kind of uh, frustration around it but I miss that bit of being put through the mill like I did when I was playing rugby and I don't create that for myself anymore and I think that's something that I need to mm -hmm. to find some way of doing something that I enjoy that I can adhere to mm -hmm. And it's that thing like I could go to the gym, I could do a class or something, I could hate it, but I'm sweating and I've, but I can find that enjoyment in something that I enjoy yeah. and then I'm going to do it for longer yeah. because it's actually become something which you get, you get I just, I'm looking forward to doing that and I know I'm going to hurt, but I'm going to feel great yeah. when I finish. I think I've said it before to, Har I think I've said it before to Harvey, can we get it, that like how we train, this isn't any disrespect to how we train now compared to how we train for rugby, but I guess it's a bit different because someone else was pushing you because you're a coach and all that sort of thing and you were paid to, to do it. Um, I used to train so much harder than I do now. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not now saying this, this isn't BS, I'm not saying it because Ross is sat here with me, but it's literally the, the conversations today have challenged me exactly the same mm -hmm. to go like, am I mentally like telling myself like, Oh, you can't do too much. And, and, I, and am, I, am I holding myself back? I'm going to challenge. Mm. I am going to challenge. Mm. I'm definitely. I'm the type of guy that I'll do this now for two days. Yeah. And then I'll forget about it. But I'm going to try and carry on a bit longer. But I'm training tomorrow morning and I'm going to have a few well, beats. I'm going to train now. Harvey's coming. I'm just, I'm just going to get. It's so true, this. I, I, I love it. something like I'm going to tag you in. <laughs> Like an air bike or intervals, and you know when you like you think, oh my god, my lungs are on fire. But but honestly, in that moment, by everybody listening, when you are absolutely on fire, because a few people, when I was you know on that hundred kilometer swim, which was only meant to be forty kilometers, <laughs> and and there was a moment when I was getting stung by jellyfish. You know, I was still pulling the hundred pound tree. I was cramping up, like the sun was beating down on me. It was in the Caribbean. And, and, and I simply just asked myself repeatedly, like kilometre after kilometre, and it's, you know, not to sound morbid, but I was like, what's hurting? Honestly, Ross, like take, like, I know, oh yeah, it's hurting, but what is actually hurting? I was like, my shoulders are sore, I'm pretty badly sunburned. And I'm like, okay, cool, be honest with yourself. But, but is there anything stopping you swimming 100 metres more? Mm. No, it's just a bit unpleasant. Yeah, yeah. Then swim a hundred more. You know, and sometimes it was actually like going like, I don't know, this sounds a bit morbid, but like, are you dying? 
And my answer would always be like, no, I don't think I'm dying. Yeah, it's like, yeah. you keep going then, what are you doing? Because <laughs> you know at some point that hurt's going to end, right? Exactly. So, it's one thing I... Unless you didn't get to the end, you would die. Oh, well. <laughs> More for me. <laughs> one of my favourite my favorite tennis players is Rafael Nadal, because he just gets in a dogfight, and he's like, Federer is so graceful, he makes it look like, oh, tennis, I shall beat you <laughs> N- Nadal comes out he's passionate he's fiery and I, and I love it but I've seen I've read a, a report from him before that he, he approaches games when he was in his peak he's like all I've got to do is outlast you like the, the pain's going to stop the discomfort is going to stop I just need to last longer than you can yeah. and it's, it's a real simple principle but the other thing that I, I, I watched and, and read the book um, Touching the Void quite a few years ago this guy that like mountaineering story and the guys were on K2 I think it was um, I might be wrong with that. Actually, most of us were in South America. But, um, he ended up falling into a crevasse. His mate cut the line. He dropped down and he crawled in a crevasse. He couldn't get, or well, broken legs, couldn't get out. So he just was like sat there for a day or so. And then when I might as well go down into the abyss. So he just started, I'm going to die anyway. So he starts going down into this crevasse and he actually sees a piece of light that comes through this and he crawls out. And he's got two broken legs pretty much. And he drags himself down this mountain to survival. And he's literally like he would set a thing about a rock in front of him and he would crawl by his fingertips, two broken legs, like, in a really bad way, but he pulled himself off the mountain, and you're like, actually, and I, you, you wind that back, and it made me think before that you go in, it's almost that thing, those are the extreme examples, but I remember doing, like, bleep tests and fitness tests when we were training. You drop out, and literally, 30 seconds afterwards, I could have done more than that. Yeah. You know it. Yeah. Hundred percent. You're disappointed because you've now lost that opportunity yeah. to go and do that a little bit You're more. Right. They are extreme examples, but it will happen daily. Yeah. The amount of times should I get out of bed right now? Mm. Yeah, get out of bed. What's stopping you? You know, do a workout. Yeah. You know, you call them hammer intervals in that like on a, imagine an air bike or hill sprints um, where you'll wait until the final one and then you'll push hard yeah, and then yeah, you'll yeah. finish. Whereas hammer intervals, and this is one thing the Royal Marine PTIs do better than anyone, is just in the middle of it, they'll just go, go now, go hard, unquestionably go hard. And you will, but then like, you, and then they'll go, right, and now you've got five more. Yeah. And you'll be like, oh man, I thought that was the last one. It's There's like, some you know, science around that, but actually setting, setting up things up and goes five reps. Yeah. And you go, all right, okay, cool, I'm gonna do five reps. And then actually, then you see what can you do when you add five more. Yeah. And there's some really, there was actually some research around athletes with cerebral palsy. Yeah. And, that was yeah, yeah, yeah. stuck into that. Nice. There's so many times you can do that as a coach. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna do five. We're gonna do five. Oh yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> There's also one where they put plastic bags on the weights of a barbell, so you don't know what weight. Yeah. 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 Right, I'm, I'm going to draw this because this conversation, unfortunately, for you guys listening, I've got one more question. Oh, yeah. Final question. No, I've got a real question. I can smell the ribs. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that mental thing pushing when I'm ru- when I'm running like CV so like I do like part of a 5k and I can, I'm, I have that same conversation with myself and I'm going I'm like going I can can you not go a bit faster than this Jacko like I, like exactly like what's hurting compared you know and all, and all that I find it much more difficult though if it's like a pull up session or maxing dips or whatever and is there anything. Is there any? Is there anything that you found like trying to get at, like trying to get into that place from it, when it's strength compared to when it's yeah. more cardio? That's is that- yeah. I mean, with cardio and stuff. So, so w- when you look at strength, strength is your body's ability to generate force. So, quite often, you know, if you are absolutely wired, that is you know, at capacity. Yes, granted, there are stories of you know mums lifting mm, cars yeah, yeah. off their kids' traps, and you know, so there is that potential that we're not locking into. So for that. You know, it, it just comes from, you know, smelling salts, your friend slapping you on your back, Jacko, yeah. still not forgiving you. <laughs> <laughs> but there is that, and, and, and it, but it's a very different mindset to, to endurance. And I think that's one thing with all of the best ultramarathon runners I've ever met. You know, they're not getting wired. They're not on the start line on smelling mm-hmm. salts because they're like, well, this is going to take it. <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. you know, so, so it is very, very different. Mm-hmm. However, if you're training for, you know, muscular hypertrophy and you're using... Uh, metabolic stress where it is a horrible mm, disgusting yeah. drop set you know ask yourself afterwards you and yeah if you could do another set after that one that wasn't hard enough I think there's something in calisthenics I was thinking about actually after we left the session today and what sometimes we're like with like a pull up set 
doing one more rep or two more reps is actually hard. If I'm, if I'm at fatigue or I'm really afraid you've got lactic acid build up, like you're just not functioning and actually trying to do another rep of the same thing is actually almost impossible because you're not strong enough, I've, I've maxed out. Yeah. But then the example we did today, we're going to handstand push-ups, feet elevated, mm -hmm. push-ups into yeah. push-ups on the floor, into push-ups on knees. There was, there was four different progressions there with each you could move from one to the next. Mm -hmm. And one thing I think with that, with the pulling sessions, when you're trying to create overload and stress like that, you've got to plan your session a little bit more. So actually, you can go pull ups, but the band's already ready, yeah. and I'm going to drop down from the band from the from yeah. body weight, and I'm going to go to the band, and it might then be that I go horizontal row. But having that structure to your plan, going actually, the this is how I'm going to move through, and I've created the conditions. I love the Oscar Wilde quote of. Um, success society you create the conditions you get the result and you then go actually i've created the conditions i've now facilitated that rather than jumping down from a set from a pull-up and going oh it's a bit hard i don't think i can do anymore mm -hmm. might just have a two-minute rest period yeah. <laughs> which yeah. is often what i do <laughs> it is or, or goes back to you know law of progressive overload doesn't matter is it a pull-up is it not can i apply more stress to this situation mm -hmm. you know less rest more weight eccentric contraction yeah. Yeah, anything yeah, yeah, yeah. can i apply more stress and sometimes for me with swimming at the moment you know, I'm like, I'm going to do 10k today, you know, I'm going to do 20k today. Can I apply more stress? Mm. And get so a tree. What? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's like tree resistance. Or like the other day in Glasgow, you know, swimming in, in two degree water, it was chilly. Yeah. That was the stress, you know. Well, so there's everyone else in the pool that David Lloyd saying when you walk in with the tree. <laughs> It's more the picnic of food at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm just like, no, it's just an eating competition with a bit of swimming. Well, I think, Jacko, what we can take away from today yeah. is that we can hold ourselves when we train together accountable for maybe dropping in a session because we've got some quite specific yeah. goals that require some quite specific. should be one session. We should do one session where we just do a blitz. Oh, let's say it's that. tomorrow Tag morning. morning. Uh, that would be tomorrow amazing. morning. Um, yeah, I'll yeah, try to train tomorrow. Now live, is it? But we'll talk on the live about tomorrow morning. A bit of um, what I like is a, um, what is it like? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When you're like accountability, yes. So I'm going to say it tonight live do it on tomorrow. IG. It's going to happen. <laughs> yes. Um, like if you make me do, my demonstrations at a workshop and everyone's watching is so much better than if I was just training on my own. If you take your shirt off, yeah. <laughs> right. just, just the expectation of like, yeah, you better do this right. <laughs> it might not. In my head, it's just what I'm telling myself. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, did you get a discount from um, all your money back from Thompson Holiday? We didn't read re the beat. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't! <laughs> He's yeah. company. I'm still yeah. looking yeah. for the beach, I swear they do. <laughs> we normally finish our podcast by asking the, our guests um, what their current impossible is, but I think with Ross it's almost a wasted question. Unless there is something well, impossible for Ross. I know, is there anything that you particularly look at and you go, do you know what, that's a street. couldn't be as skinny as us. <laughs> I, that's just impossible. Yeah, yeah. Four ribs. <laughs> Four I, I sometimes think that you. I've got stuff in my impossible box. Because, but, but I look at it and go, well, it's only there temporary. Nothing's firmly rooted there anymore, but it's just something I can't do. So if I try and do a single arm pull up at the moment, it's impossible. Yeah. But all I need to do is put a bit of time and yeah, move that out. So is there anything that you currently look at and you go, actually, this is a big, audacious, horrible, nasty thing that I want to do. Yeah. It looks like it's impossible, but I'm going to start the process using a great book such as your own to guide you <laughs> to the goal. Yeah, no, it's, so there is, there is actually uh, yeah. something... Uh, been is this an exclusive? Well, I, so I'm, I'm not allowed to say it yet. Uh, yeah, but, this thing. No, but I'm going to actually chat to you guys off air because I actually need your advice on this. So genuinely, I can't say it, but you will be... Well, you will be the first to know about it, but you'll also be the first to, to broadcast it because oh, genuinely, I want to do some some really cool stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying it, but I think, you know, a lot of... I don't know, I'm talking very cryptic, but basically a lot like of stuff it. that you've spoke about and what you are actually genuinely pioneering at the moment in terms of you know shoulder mobility, strength, mm. prehab and everything like that, I am going to need in, in sort of bucket loads and stuff. So yeah, off air, we'll talk, but on air, you will be the first to know what my impossible is. Well, I think I is actually you've been able to stand against the wall with back flapping your arms <laughs> yeah. I can dream! I can dream! What's his shoulder mobility? It's, 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 there's something there. For, we can, Jacko and I can beat him at shoulder mobility. That's how we see it. It's bad, it's bad. Right, you also know how to wrap this up, don't you? The sign-off. I do! Class dismissed. We're gonna, this, you as the guest get to, get to finish this off. So thanks for joining us, guys. It's been a longer, a longer course for us, but we get we don't get the um, opportunity to pick a, a guy's brain like right like Ross on an everyday occasion. Rad Jack and I would ramble on forever, but having somebody here, we wanted to give you a little bit more value. So on that note, Jack, have anything to add? Uh, well, just if you are interested in finding out where you can find Ross, if you don't follow him on his on social or you don't. Um, you haven't seen his book yet. All the, the the links will be in the description, obviously. Hello, so make sure you check him out and give him a follow. 
So until next time, class dismissed. <laughs>